Welcome back, folks. I appreciate your joining us for what is going to be our luncheon keynote. Uh, for those that may be joining us at the, uh, the beginning of your participation, I'm going to review a little bit about this morning. Uh, we started off with what was a thought-provoking uh, keynote address by Roy Austin. Uh, we followed with what was a panel uh, representing practitioners from the justice domain to include courts representatives and uh, law enforcement component. And now we're going to take a little bit of a, a left turn and engage one of our private sector members uh, to tell us a little bit about their solution and how the focus of our, morning, of our morning's discussion, data and the value of data, might be more easily accessed and readily available to operational practitioners. Uh, to that end, uh, we have a gentleman by the name of Bob Parker, uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about him and his background. He represents a company called Cambridge Semantics. He is their senior director. Uh, he is responsible for establishing what is their public sector practice at Cambridge Semantics. And really the value of that is because he understood that what is already a successful tool is something that might be able to readily assist and support the justice domain as an example. And in our case, potentially help support the progress that we could make in justice reform. Uh, today, he's going to tell us a little bit about that solution. I know that we have a mix of not only practitioners, but technologists, uh, but Bob is going to focus on the operational side of the house, uh, still giving us a great preview on the technical solution, on the business case that they have utilized in the past, and in some of the lessons learned. So Bob, welcome to the IGES uh, mid-year event. Uh, we appreciate you joining us and we look forward to your, uh, to your dialogue. Great, uh, Maria, can you hear me okay? We can hear you well, thank you so much. Great, thank you for inviting me. And uh, it's, it's really, um, I'm humbled to be uh, really joining this, this group and this community uh, with uh, an opportunity to share some information about really some innovative technology that is uh, driving change in how data is managed and uh, likely has uh, some significant um, opportunities to improve how uh, data is shared and managed um, in the law enforcement, criminal justice uh, community. So um, we're going to keep this pretty high level today, um, really just an introduction to some of the concepts. And ideally, um, we'll have an opportunity to interface down the line and talk about specific um, use cases or applications for uh, this technology as we uh, get to know each other a little bit further. Um, I, I also want to take a moment to thank Paul uh, Wormelli. Um, you know, Paul um, came through and, uh, and introduced me to the IGES community, uh, is actually instrumental in getting me to uh, have an opportunity to speak to all of you today. And uh, as um, some of you will likely know, Paul uh, is uh, certainly an innovator and, uh, and, and drives a lot of um, uh, change as it relates to how uh, data is shared across uh, the different organizations. And uh, I know he's keen on Knowledge Graph as a, as a potential approach to meeting some of the uh, organizational needs and, and really um, excited to, uh, again to, uh, to be with you here today. So again, the topic that I'm gonna be talking about is, uh, is just uh, 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 knowledge Graph and, and Cambridge Semantics is one of the leading innovators and providers of Knowledge Graph technology in the marketplace. Uh, as Maria said, I lead and look after our, um, uh, our public sector go to market. Um, I've largely focused uh, those efforts in um, the federal government uh, across HHS and, and DOD agencies. Uh, we have a, um, a significant deployment of our platform um, within the FDA as they are leveraging Knowledge Graph to support all of the analytics and insights that they're looking to garner for um, uh, the drug submission through approval process and all of the adverse event reporting that goes on through that. So fairly topical, obviously, with today's landscape of uh, vaccines and so forth. But um, uh, again, I'm just going to make a, an introduction to the concepts and technology and uh, ideally uh, field some questions or, or see uh, what follow-ups folks might have. So you know, I'll start with <laughs> the, uh, the obvious uh, statement from Gartner, right? Where they talk, and, uh, and this is not a new problem, right? Unprecedented levels of data 
um, both uh, the scale of it, uh, the distri di uh, distri dist distributed nature of, of where data resides, uh, really makes it very difficult and continues to make it very difficult for organizations to really leverage all of their data assets in a, in a, in a very cohesive way. Um, and it's given rise to the need for more innovative approaches to support data integration and discovery. And that's really uh, uh, how the knowledge graph market uh, emerged and, uh, and certainly has been, been gaining significant momentum over the past, uh, past few years. So, um, you know, what is a knowledge graph? Um, you know, I'll start there and I'm, again, try to keep this high level and conceptual. It's, it's, it's a database technology. It's just what makes it better and different in a way is that it, it connects data and exposes relationships in data that traditional technologies uh, struggle to do so without a lot of uh, either programming or work, right? So um, it's non-disruptive. It's not meant to rip and replace anything that you have. It's really additive and complementary uh, to the data infrastructures that an organization may already have. Um, and, it, and it can scale. One of the limitations on graph over the years uh, has been uh, really its requirement for compute power. And, um, and uh, with, with today's technology landscape and some of the cloud-based technologies uh, and some innovation in how graph databases operate, um, the, uh, the, the platforms now can scale and support the kinds of data volumes and query volumes that organizations are looking for. Um, so again, um, it connects data, it accepts change very readily. It, it, you can add data to it very easily. Uh, with, a, with very minimal impact. Um, and again, it, the, really the, the, one of the key sort of superpowers of it is how it links and exposes relationships and data that can be exploited to garner insights and, and drive analytics. Um, so so this, this really shows sort of the big idea here of why you would go forward with, uh, with trying to establish a knowledge graph as a data architecture to support the kind of insights that an organization is looking to garner. Um, the, the line along the top sort of represents what most organizations are sort of grappling with, which is um, they have questions um, that they're trying to answer. Again, this is pretty high level, but uh, you get the concept. Um, and and they, the, the, the answers are in the data that they have, but the data is spread out or in silos or in different places. And they, so they go about trying to source that information um, loading it, curating it, bringing it together, preparing it, and ultimately trying to answer those questions or deliver the insights uh, from a particular set of data. Um, what that leaves behind in some cases is the unanticipated questions that surface as they're going through that process. And that time arrow along the top can sometimes be weeks, even months to get a, a curated data set that can, you can ask and answer questions of. The idea behind a knowledge graph is really to pre-stage and pre-integrate all of your information uh, in, in such a way that you can ask and answer questions of the underlying um, uh, data models that are created in a very agile way uh, without having to go back and curate and bring together um, uh, you know, data from a number of sources uh, you know, uh, over time. Um, and, and it allows you to not only answer the known questions, which many um, uh, traditional technologies are built to support, but also ask and answer some of the unanticipated questions that, uh, that surface. So this is sort of the, the big idea, if you will. So, you know, in order to, to talk about, you know, the, the, again, how this is better and different, some of this is comparison to the way that this problem has been attacked through other tech, you know, technologies. Um, you know, most organizations, when they're trying to aggregate data have gone the route of building up um, data warehouses or large data marts or uh, in relational technologies, your, your rows, columns and tables and, and modeling all of that data in such a way that you can ask and answer questions of it. Um, where that approach has fallen a bit short, again, is because you do need to pre-model everything you can't add data very easily to it. So it's quite rigid and inflexible. And, uh, and again, most times these data warehouse projects um, start to go ahead and at, to be able to ask and answer lots of questions. Um, so they're very lengthy and expensive before they really stand anything up that's of value. So that gave rise to the, you know, some of the big data technologies, what's known as a data lake. Um, 
And, uh, you know, again, the difference between warehouses and data lakes is, is that you didn't have to design anything. You could really bring a lot of data together in a data lake. It's what's known as schemaless. So you didn't have to create a model or design in order to bring data into a data lake. Um, where, where data lakes have fallen short a bit is, um, number one, they, they, they do require some very specific skills to operate. But moreover than that, they're really not that good at data integration. They don't represent data in an integrated way that can you can ask and answer questions of it. Again, without doing sort of a lot of programming or work in order to, to show that data in your lake in a way that can be exploited. So a knowledge graph is really the best of both worlds there. It's again, it's model on demand. And what I mean by that is it's you don't have to design ahead of time. You can bring data into a knowledge graph um, without having to create the model because it, it essentially creates the, the graph models as the data is brought in. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it supports, uh, again, data volume and query volume. So it's, it's like having a data lake, um, but it, it does represent the data in, in such a way where those relationships are exposed, similar to the way the warehouse would have it. So it adds that, that flexibility that the data lake provided, by, but providing very curated, uh, consistent, clean, data that the warehouse provided. And uh, again, everything is modeled and linked and persisted um, you know, for use by the data consumers that need it. Um, so it's quite an innovation and it's certainly uh, something that uh, the marketplace uh, is uh, taking, taking um, uh, notice of. Uh, and Gartner has tracked th these trends um, and uh, continues to do so, both Gartner and Forrester. Um, you know, they've seen the fact that uh, and, and have gotten inquiries uh, over 280% increase in inquiries around how graph can, can meet certain business needs or goals. And they think that the adoption of graph technologies is going to increase to 80% in the next several years because they, they do see the, the value in the fact that, you know, finding relationships and, and integrating diverse data using graph will ultimately be the foundation for how organizations garner insights and, uh, and do their analytics moving forward. Um, Forrester similarly you know, has what they call the data fabric um, uh, wave report. And the data fabric is really just an architecture that can leverage knowledge graph as a way of, of uh, delivering on that. Um, and you know they they've uh, they placed my company in the leaders quadrant, but that's uh, the the point of, the, of of showing this slide is really just to show um, how why would you use graph models? And it's essentially some of the things I've mentioned, right? It, it makes complicated enterprise data simple. Um, uh, it allows you to find and use data more readily with great uh, agility. And ultimately, in this report, they call out that graph is the fastest way to connect data, especially when it's um, you know has a level of complexity or is in uh, significant silos. So again, the analysts are seeing the the opportunity that uh, some of these uh, these innovative technologies uh, have created. So I'm going to talk for a minute about a a, a practical use of of uh, of graph. Um, Again, in a bit of an adjacent uh, world and, a, and a, an adjacent use case uh, to the criminal justice uh, world and some of the, uh, the law enforcement use cases. Um, this, this one in particular is in a financial services account, but they're, they're building out a surveillance um, environment to support uh, detecting and uh, you know, insider, potentially uh, detecting and preventing insider trading activities within their firm. Uh, it's certainly part of a regulatory compliance requirement. And uh, again, sorry for the busyness of this slide, but uh, ultimately this is just showing uh, the power in which uh, a knowledge graph is, is supporting uh, the integration of very disparate um, sets of information, both structured data and unstructured data. And again, you know, data was all over the place. They had, uh, uh, and th the purpose of this use case is to combine their employee behavioral data. So all of the badge swipes and logins and emails and phone calls and text messages and chats, anything that an employee does to the outside world is tracked because it needs to be to ensure that they're not violating uh, any insider trading activities. But integrating that data with all of their trading data is a, is a daunting challenge. Uh, and this is what Knowledge Graph is particularly good at. Um, they were able to bring together the, the annotated unstructured data with all of their trading data and, and do it in such a way that they now can mine this uh, and, and create alerts uh, against any kind of uh, uh, potential nefarious activities associated with uh, their trading activity. 
uh, very important to be able to show the regulators um, that they, you know, that they have this under control. And again, I talked a little bit about knowledge graph at scale. Um, in this particular case, it, it does show, you know, this is, uh, their structured data is 400 million transactions over the course of a five year, they have to maintain this data for five years. Um, 50 million reference records. Their unstructured data is 321 million messages, um, all of which are indexed and available to search uh, in an elastic search mechanism. So it's a very, uh, uh, certainly a high volume of data. They're querying this on a regular basis uh, and they're, they're uncovering alerts associated with uh, some of this potential nefarious behavior. So now they're able to ask and answer questions, uh, things that they really couldn't do before. And these are just uh, a few different examples. Um, you know, uh, what is the timeline of events between two individuals and, and, and their communication path? Again, this is an adjacent uh, use case to maybe what uh, this audience is, is dealing with, but you hopefully can make the correlation between this use of knowledge graph and the kinds of data uh, challenges and the kind of use cases that, that uh, certainly exist in this, uh, in this community. So I'm going to, last but not least, I'm just going to talk of a few mechanics here of sort of what this looks like to deploy, right, and how it uh, supports um, um, uh, the kinds of data integration activities that you might look for. These five boxes along the bottom, you know, attempt to represent the disparate data sources that might contribute to building out an enterprise knowledge graph or a use case driven knowledge graph. There's relational sources, there's warehouses and data marts, you may or may not have some big data technology. Some of this is in the cloud, some of it's on premise, um, uh, and there's lots of unstructured data, documents, reports, et cetera, that could, could contribute to uh, garnering insights. But again, integrating those things is a particular challenge. The ribbon that you see along the top is that, that data fabric architecture powered by a knowledge graph. And um, it's a layer on top of all of the data assets that the organization has. Uh, it, it abstracts all of the complexity of the underlying different formats that the data might come in, and it creates a common model in which to access and ultimately discover and explore uh, data within an organization. Um, so if that's sort of the top down look, this might represent sort of the bottom up look of this approach, uh, where you have your structured and unstructured data being brought together into an intelligent web of information and that allows the organization then to harmonize and blend uh, analytic ready data products that can be delivered to the data consumers that need them uh, and or feed other kinds of advanced analytics or even ML and AI uh, applications if that's needed. But again, it's about the agility in which this can now happen uh, that, uh, that makes it quite powerful. So I, I I, I put a couple slides in here to talk through uh, the use of unstructured data because I think it'd be particularly valuable to this community, and it's really you know quite straightforward um, uh, as a as a, a, a piece of building out a knowledge graph. And you know the the, uh, the use of uh, both NLP or annotators to pull out uh, critical information out of unstructured information and add that to your knowledge graph to allow that to be exploited for analytics is a very powerful capability. And ultimately uh, you're able to, all these color coded terms here are ultimately part of a data a model that now you can search on, filter on and, and try to come back and, uh, and, and work through to, to uh, uncover some insights. So it's like identifying and annotating relative terms, associating the concepts from the unstructured text uh, with your structured data sources and then ultimately discovering insights as, uh, as those uh, items are brought together. Um, so uh, in summary, you know, it's about employing semantics and graph to create actionable enterprise data architecture. Um, a critical aspect of our go-to-market uh, is the support of open standards. Um, and I know this is an important aspect uh, to uh, both IGES and uh, those adopters of NEEM uh, that uh, you wanna make sure that the data is interoperable. And uh, um, uh, one aspect of our platform and, and certain graph uh, solutions uh, as a whole is the use of open standards. WC3 standards, RDF and OWL are the, are the, the, the baseline standards that this technology is built on and ultimately it allows the data to be interoperable. And that's uh, certainly critically important. Um, uh, so you're, you're able to connect and contextualize all of the data and empower 
your users uh, with great agility to garner more insights more quickly. So uh, with that, uh, again, try to keep that relatively high level value proposition based around the use of this technology and the advantages. Um, I'll pause there and uh, see if there are any questions. Thank you, Bob. That was very informative. Uh, we do have one audience question. And of course, I have several that I'd like to follow up. And I'm actually going to invite uh, Melissa Weinsberg. She's our director of programs here at IGIS, who's been part of these discussions to join us as well, if she'd like. So I'm going to read off the first question from the audience. Uh, has Cambridge Semantics related the graph layer representation to the traditional architecture fr frameworks uh, such as TOGIF or FIA? Well, I'd have to be familiar with those architecture frameworks to be able to answer that question. So I, uh, I would like to take that away and uh, I will get an answer back to whoever uh, asked that. Um, we will and, make, that uh, was Doug Oates and we will make sure to facilitate that, Bob. Uh, yeah, I apologize for not having that offhand. No worries, uh, none at all. So actually the question that I would like to ask relates more back to the justice community. Uh, certainly your representation and uh, discussion with regard to the financial community uh, is one that several of us could be able to then relate back to several of our components in justice. But walk us through the process <laughs> that you typically take uh, with clients uh, that in this case, the example we'll use will be say at a law enforcement agency. And uh, maybe they want to communicate with their uh, peer organizations uh, across the border and they have two or three different data sources. Uh, what would the uh, the methodology be to get you from point A to B? Yeah, so you know th that's that's one. If I didn't touch on it properly, that's it's one advantage of this approach is is really how pragmatic, uh, candidly, the use of knowledge graph and graph databases can be, in the fact that you you're not you don't need to boil the ocean or or integrate all of the data in order to start working with it. Uh, you can start use case by use case. Um, so if there's a particular uh, set of insights that a uh, law enforcement agency is struggling to, to uh, either rapidly or with agility uh, and ask and answer questions. Uh, and maybe as you said, Maria, it's, it, it might only have you know, two to three or four da data sources that need to be brought together. Um, you, you just start there. Um, and you, you, uh, you bring those in. We, we work with clients uh, in many cases on these initial use cases as proof of concepts, um, really to start proving out the value of this approach um, uh, and the kinds of data discovery and exploration that can then be done once this data is integrated in the graph models. Um, but, but usually it progresses from there uh, whereas the first three to four uh, data sources that are brought in just become foundational for you know, future use cases or other use cases, because the way that you can bring new data into a knowledge graph is, is quite easy. And it's just a matter of uh, bringing it in, modeling it up, linking it to the existing data. And now that data becomes available to ask and answer questions and may support use case numbers two through X. Does that answer the question? Yes, it does. So Great. tell me, uh, if we go to the, the notion of a, uh, a client actually going through that process and then having that available, do they see your product as the, uh, the dashboard that's in front of them at all times? Or is this something that then may, be, uh, may serve as a, a backend uh, functionality? Well, it's a little bit of both. As it relates to Cambridge Semantics Solution, we have uh, built the most complete sort of end-to-end -end application layer to drive the, the rapid glide path of adoption of this. So there's a knowledge graph management and metadata catalog as part of the platform. And it's, it, it, it supports the end-to-end -end process from onboarding to modeling, to blending, and ultimately accessing the data. We do have a visualization layer right within our platform. Um, uh, or, uh, you know, the, the other thing that we work on because we are uh, one of the hallmarks of the platform is interoperability. We do use open standards, what's known as OData or JDBC standards to share analytic ready data products out with consuming applications that an organization might be more familiar with. Things like, you know, that there, things like Tableau or Power BI or other kinds of you know, BI tools that they may be more familiar with in, in going through their data. Um, so it's, it's th there's a data engineering component uh, that's managed in the platform. And then there's the access layer 
And that's uh, very flexible, both within the platform as well as sharing the data out to consuming tools. Wonderful. Melissa has a comment, uh, so I'm gonna let her jump in. Great. Can you hear me, Maria? Yes, we can, Melissa, thank you. So thanks for letting me jump in. I just wanted to comment, you know, I find this technology very intriguing. It certainly fits with the concepts and the discussion that came this morning from Roy Austin and the judge and Mike Bell. I mean, the entire topic this morning was around the need to be able to access data and really to be able to access it quickly. This looks very promising in terms of a potential technology that may allow us to do that very thing. As we all know, in the criminal justice community, it seems like we're always 10 years behind um, banking and finance in terms of new technologies and being able to utilize them. Certainly, I think a proof of concept with this um, technology would be awesome. I know there are a lot of practitioners in the audience and I think we would certainly be interested in hearing from folks who may have an interest in something like this and really taking the opportunity to see how this would work in the criminal justice community. I think the ability to integrate both structured and unstructured data quickly is extremely significant, especially the meta metadata um, that's available in video camera footage. Um, this is huge. We're all struggling to figure out how to manage that large amount of data. And this may be a promising opportunity for us to be able to do so. Yeah. And do so you know, quickly. I, I, as, as I mentioned in the, my opening remarks, um, you know, I, I, I've been largely, you know, spending a, a good amount of my time with the various chief data officers that across the um, uh, the DOD agencies, Navy, uh, Air Force, etc., and they published uh, the, their the group of CDOs actually published a data strategy um, last year that you know talks about uh, flexible architecture, uh, the, the use of technology that's based on open standards, um, you know, interoperability. Uh, visibility, accessibility, linked, trustworthy, understandable, and secure data. They call this the Vaultus data strategy. And the thing that I that you know we align really nicely to um, to that data strategy, and I've actually been speaking to several uh, agencies about the adoption of this to align with how they're going forward. So I think you know th this why I, I was quite thrilled again with Paul's introduction, I just and and the opportunity to introduce this capability in, a, in an adjacent world, certainly DHS and other federal agencies, but also at the state and local level to talk about the promise of knowledge graph and how it can um, re really innovate how um, the agencies, uh, you know, in those areas are, are leveraging their data, analyze, you know, and being able to garner insights uh, in a much more agile fashion. Bob, if you were able to participate in this morning's session, you not only understood that we all agree that data is critical and a priority, uh, but that the change management process, the education process, the subsequent funding are, are all issues that we need to address in tandem. And um, hopefully we can go ahead and do that collectively in the future. Uh, let me ask you, and I'll put you on the spot, but I think I know the answer. Uh, would you be willing to participate in a proof of concept with the IDIS community uh, so that not only uh, that gives you the visibility to uh, sort of show your wares and your, the value to the solution, but most importantly, I have to say, uh, to allow the practitioners and your peer industry uh, to understand its value and to learn more about this potential. Yeah, um, that's, a, that's certainly something we've discussed, Marie, in a logical next step. Really pick a use case that is... Um, uh, you know, again, a, a daunting data integration challenge, one that, you know, um, represents a, a, a difficult problem and see how Knowledge Graph really applies to help solve it. So uh, I would love to be able to participate in something like that and, and work with you on selecting a use case that would be compelling to, to then, you know, reshare out to, uh, to this community and see how uh, we could start some adoption. Wonderful. One more thing to add to our to-do list. So we appreciate your, <laughs> your comments, your education. Melissa, any parting thoughts? I'll no, take that I, just, I, I find this an exciting technology. I find it very intriguing and look forward to the opportunity to explore it further. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. And Bob, you. any, any uh, concluding thoughts? 
Yeah, no, I, I uh, you know, I just want to say thanks to uh, to you and, and Melissa and the team and, um, you know, for giving us the opportunity to expose uh, this, you know, this technology and this uh, uh, innovative capability to this this community. And, and I, I, I think uh, there, there's great things that will come down the line. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for participating in the mid-year event. And to the participants, we're going to take another break, a short break. Um, we are going to be joined uh, at 1.30 uh, by representatives from IDEA4 and from the uh, Fairfax County PD. We have Ashwini Jaral, uh, current founder and COO of IDEA4, as well as Major Ed O'Carroll um, from Fairfax County to chat with us with regard to uh, what are issues of officer wellness. And frankly, uh, given today's discussion, given even hallway chats that we've been having, uh, it goes far beyond uh, officer wellness, uh, but the concepts are ones that will resonate to your own domains, to your own practices, and we hope that you'll uh, find them informative. So uh, we look forward to chatting again at 1.30 this afternoon. Thank you so much.